<laughs> All right, so uh, welcome everybody. Welcome back to those of you who were here uh, in the last day and a half, and uh, a special welcome to those of you who are just joining us right now uh, for the next day and a half. So uh, my name is Jay Berger, uh, Associate Director of Digital Scholars and Services here in the Mass University Library, uh, and also Chair of the uh, Portage Curation Expert Group. Uh, and this is Lee Wilson, who is a Manager of, of Services. Service Manager for Portage. Thank you, Lee. <laughs> All right, so we're very happy to, to welcome you here for, for the next day and a half. And so Lee and I are going to give a, a little bit of an introduction here and try, try, set, the, set the stage, set the, the frame the conversation that we're going to have over the next day uh, and a half. Um, before we get going, just a couple uh, extra thanks. So um, a special thanks to, to Shirk for the, the Connections Grant that funded all of this and made this all possible. Uh, also thanks to Carl and Portage who have supported this as well with InKind as well as, uh, as, as uh, some, some funds as well uh, and McMaster University Library as well for what they've done. Uh, for this event. So um, the, the most important pieces of the, the housekeeping are, are up at the top of the slide there. So you have uh, the Wi-Fi information. Uh, if that doesn't work, find find me at some point and I will, I will find you another solution that will work. So the program you can find at any time, uh, datacuration.github.io and our, our hashtag for the event is CDCF2019. So let's get moving here. So uh, just a, a land acknowledgement. So McMaster University sits on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the dish with one spoon wampum agreement. All right, and, and before we get into the meat of this, uh, we're gonna do this once again. So uh, we would like the program committee to stand up and be recognized. This is a this was a task of, of dozens uh, of people who were involved in this. And so uh, we're having them stand up not only because we want to acknowledge what they've done, but also these are going to be your facilitators in the group conversations that we have later today and tomorrow as well. So if I can get the program committee just to stand up for a quick second and we could, we could say thank you. Uh, and acknowledge you. All right, so uh, Lee and I, like I said, we're going we're gonna to try to run through this pretty quickly, but we want to set the conversation for what we want to get out of uh, today. So we, we brought together uh, all of our smartest friends, the most knowledgeable people we know, uh, and we're going to put you to work here so that we can, we can figure out what we're going to do uh, as a nation to, to address issues uh, concerning data curation. So quick primer of what is data curation. We'll talk about what we want to get out of here, uh, outcomes and deliverables, uh, and then Lee's going to set the stage a little bit with some, some things that we're thinking about and some things that we're hoping that, that as a group we, we can come to some solutions around. So uh, there's many definitions for data curation. This is a very abridged version of the, the CASRI definition. So data curation is the act of management of research data as it is created, maintained, used, archived, shared, and reused. Uh, and there's many examples of data creation activities. I won't go through all these activities. And there's a link beneath if you want to see even more, if you want to see about 47 examples or something, the Data Creation Network uh, has provided all of these uh, different activities. But it, it ranges significantly. Can I interrupt? Uh, there's a question so I meant to ask and you can know the more of the question. Sorry if I We're going to have to whisper for those. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I'm going to talk here. Is that okay for everybody? All right, so I'll put it down. That's good, because I don't like to hear myself uh, when I talk. And that's 75%. <coughs> okay, how's that? Okay, perfect. All right, so uh, I'm going to move through this then, and we're going to keep going. So what we want to do today, our, our main goal is to develop a vision and a roadmap for a national approach to data creation in Canada. And there's many different uh, forms that this could take, and, and we're looking for you to help us figure out uh, those forms today. So uh, I'm just going to run through the objectives, but we want to develop a shared understanding of the value of data curation and its place in data management and stewardship. Uh, help with the, with the experiences of everybody, define the current state of data curation capacity in Canada. So what are the needs, what are the requirements, what are the challenges that we face right now? Uh, identify uh, what, what resources would be required to address the challenges and support best practices in data curation. Um, think about the ways in which national coordination or support uh, could address some of these needs. And then identify the ways specifically in which the portage curation coordinator could support these needs. 
Okay, and, and uh, the outcomes and deliverables from this event, uh, we're going to provide a summary of, of what's uh, happened during the event. Uh, we hope to have a clear statement of the value of data creation, uh, and we're going to have a vision for a desired state of creation activities, or maybe a couple different options that exist that we can put out to the community for consultation. And so you are all going to help us with the first stage of this, which is uh, to create an event report, which comes out with some sort of set of recommendations about strengthening a national community practice for data curation, uh, and then thinking about what services and support might, could, or might, or should uh, be created, and whether or not that's all coordinated at the national level, or whether there's something that can be taken and, and managed at various levels. Uh, and so we're going to put together a draft from what comes out over the next day and a half, and then we're going to send this all back out to everyone as well to provide some input. Uh, and hopefully by then we can get something that's, that's relatively robust that we can act upon. So this is how, uh, this is how the, the, the discussions are going to go, and so we're going to start with this broad question of how could or should data curation be supported at a national level, uh, get you thinking about what are the existing needs and challenges, think about what resources and services could meet those requirements, uh, think about how these might be provided and coordinated and thinking of in terms of a, some sort of a model, uh, and then thinking about those models, what are the strengths and weaknesses, and then this is sort of iterative, then you go back and think about, well, this has the weaknesses, what other, what other resources and services could, could we create? And so we're going to try to work through that over the next day and a half or so. So I'm going to hand it off to Lee, and Lee's going Lee's to frame this a little bit more for you. Great, thank you. Yeah, so what we wanted to do with this introduction was really kind of just spark you uh, to be starting to think about these kinds of questions. Uh, Jay and I, the Creation Expert Group and others have been thinking about these for a, a long time. Uh, and so what we put together here on the screen is just sort of a list of possible components that might be a part of some kind of a data curation network or data curation model. Um, and so this list is not exhaustive, but I, I think so whatever we do kind of come together and create here is going to have some elements of some of these. Uh, so the first one would be a formal communication channel for data, uh, data curators in Canada. This could be very informal. Um, it could be a sort of a listserv, which kind of quasi already exists, uh, or it could be a little more formalized with a, with a Slack channel or a Google group. Um, so it depends really what, what that's going to look like. Um, a knowledge base for guidance and training materials so that we have standardized training materials. Uh, that curators can draw upon. Uh, a, what does the central support role for data curation across Canada look like? Um, so here we're going to think about degrees of sort of centralized support. Are we going to have many curators whose role is to work across our institutions, providing support from a more centralized position? Or is it going to be more distributed with uh, sort of a national data curation coordination or support, uh, but with actual creation work being done more locally. Uh, then we're going to think about increased local support for data curation at your institution. This is going to be a key factor in whatever we create. Uh, some kind of a shared curation model or at least an agreed upon set of workflows or procedures around data curation so that we can get some standardization and some around uh, data quality control in our repositories, and as well as coordinating training opportunities uh, to develop curation skills and capacity at our institutions. So this is sort of uh, an axis that Jay and I came up with based on a number of our, our discussions. We often found ourselves talking about different elements or components and thinking about them in, ter in terms of how formal or informal are they, how centralized or how decentralized are they. And we think that Whatever model we come up with is going to sit somewhere on this axis. It's not a, a perfect, uh, it's not a perfect model by any means, uh, but we think it's a good way to help frame the conversation. And so we wanted to sort of present it to you. So there's a number of kind of options um, here that I've sketched out just to give you a sense of what we mean by formal and centralized uh, or decentralized. Um, so for example, on the formal centralized axis, here you might have a team of national data curators. Uh, that support Canadian research community in conjunction with local service providers. And they've developed formalized workflows, standards, and procedures for doing that. So it's highly centralized and very formalized. On the other flip side of decentralized and informal, maybe you have, it's more lightweight, it's a community of practice. Uh, it's local curators who all just want to kind of band together on a Slack channel or a Google group, ask questions, share information back and forth. Um, formal and decentralized, could be something like curation services provided locally, um, but the standards, policies, and procedures are all sort of set nationally. Uh, somewhere else, maybe lower or closer towards the more centralized, could be um, sort of partial curator FTEs 
that are in institutions that work part-time for their, their local university and part-time uh, for, for a national initiative, kind of working across Canada. Uh, and then centralized and informal would be something like national data curation support that develops guidance materials, but not sort of very strict standardized policies that everyone needs to uh, adhere to, and is available to respond to community questions and provide uh, guidance as needed. So again, I'm not saying these are the four models we need to choose from, nor that this axis is necessarily <laughs> um, the be all end all, but uh, again, we just wanted to kind of get you thinking about this and, and get the conversation started. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the schedule. Uh, so this is for the first day, um, so the opening remarks, and then we're going to have an opening uh, plenary with Jeff Moon to talk about the Canadian DRI landscape. And then we'll have a panel and audience discussion section uh, talking about DRI, RDM, and the role of data curation. Then there'll be a brief half an hour break, and we'll come back and have a presentation from representatives of the Data Curation Network. And then we're going to have a lightning round wrap-up discussion. Okay, so let's begin. <laughs> As if we hadn't already begun. That's right. <laughs> All right, let's see, let's see how that, we haven't actually tested this out yet with uh, a large group. So for uh, much of what we're going to do in terms of getting uh, feedback back from you uh, during the keynote presentation and the panel discussion, we're gonna have you using uh, Mentimeter to, to add your questions. We hope that this facilitates question asking by everybody and, and on your, if you log in, if you go to menti.com on any device, it's a web, web uh, app and put in the code 249691. Uh, you will be able to respond to whatever questions being given. And so as we move forward to the keynote and the panel discussion, uh, you are going to see on, in front of you an opportunity to put in a question. You're also going to see everybody else's question, so you can plus one their question as well. And we think this is going to work. We think this is going to allow the, the most upvoted question to bubble up to the top, and we can, it'll be up to Lisa whether or not we answer that question or we go <laughs> uh, to something else. So we'll just leave this open for a minute. This is just this is just general feedback that Lee and I want to take, yes. uh, and we just want to get you all in Mentimeter already and ready to go here. So take a minute and uh, uh, write in your answers. Someone's going to be disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> we got a day and a half. We know. <laughs> Twenty-two. There it is. <laughs> Does it turn into a Q and A? <laughs> Yeah, we'll give you a couple more minutes here to add your feedback. This is, this is fantastic, actually. Thanks, everybody. There's uh, a lot of common themes coming up here in relation to uh, networking and just having conversations with people, which is great. Uh, and, then, and then figuring out what we're going to do at you know, regional, national, and international levels and hooking into best practices there. So uh, I'll give you one more minute to, to answer the last piece. So it looks like everyone's done. Um, this is just updating. Okay, so we'll we'll let this collect, uh, and it'd be cool to share this back out with the community too. So we'll we'll try to do that at some point. All right, so at this point, your app should have switched now to questions for the keynote and panel. So this is where you can enter a question as Jeff or as the panel uh, are speaking. And so with that, we're going to switch over and uh, and bring Jeff Moon up here. 
So I'll give you the introduction. So Jeff Moon is the director of Portage, a national library-based network launched by the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, or CARL, with the goal of building capacity and coordinating research data management activities in Canada. Prior to his role with Portage, Jeff served as a data librarian at Queen's University Library, uh, as academic director of the Queen's Research Data Center, and as a manager of the Queen's University RDM service. <laughs> Is this working? Is this working now? Is that is that good? Good? That's China, where do I want it? Yes, I want your time. I <laughs> I didn't even think of that. Is that better? Can you hear me in the back? Okay, that's good. And I would not want to have somebody over there tell me that we're making too much noise because I'd say, too bad, learn about curation. So. Well, thank you all for coming. I'm really glad to see some new faces and the familiar faces who have been here over the last day and a half. I'm grateful for your stamina. And uh, the first two day and a half were fantastic. Um, I'm here today to give you a bit of a 20,000 foot overview of where we are in Canada with all this digital research infrastructure talk that you've been hearing word of. And some of you may know about this, some of you may know not much, so much about this, but I'm hoping by the end of this you'll have a better sense of where we are today in Canada. So we are looking at this rather familiar research data lifecycle kind of model in the context of curation over this, this, these three days or this day and a half in front of us. Um, but before we get started, I just thought I'd run you through something that for those of you who are at the NADI conference have already seen this, so I apologize to James and anybody else who was at the NADI conference, but I think we should just sort of review. Should you save your data? Or for the context of this talk, should you curate your data? And so let's work through the flowchart together. Did you generate some data? No? Well then stop procrastinating, you get out there and start collecting. <laughs> if yes, is storage of this data going to cause you physical pain? If yes, I suggest you review where you're storing your data. Is saving all this data going to lead to the end of civilization as we know it? Maybe, well, with that civilization, would it really be that bad, you know, the state of the world? And finally, is saving this data going to reduce the ability to buy chocolate? If yes, discard all data, run away fast. But if not, curate your data and your metadata and code. Okay. So with that established, I think we're all pretty confident that we should be curating data because I'm still able to buy chocolate. So there are many reasons why you want to curate or manage your data, and they're all listed here. Uh, and this is just a partial list for short. Um, I think all of these um, emerge in part from the FAIR principles. They all could be tied back in some way or other to the FAIR principles, and the trust principles are related to repositories. And we're here today to talk about a lot of these reasons why we are managing our data. But what keeps me up at night, the things that I get worried about, and I have more than one occasion had happen to me, are avoiding domination by commercial interests. We have in the last month or a month and a half received emails from one of these people saying, contact us, we want to show you what we've got, we want to collaborate, we want to, no, you want our data. And then you want to charge back for it. That's your model, we don't like it, stay away. And I, I really shouldn't say that, so there, there may be a role or a place for these folks, but they're not really in my, in my mindset, that's not where I want to be. And I don't want to lose any data. I'm a pack rat by nature, and I hate to see data die because of neglect or because of mismanagement or whatever. And so I really don't want to lose data either. So that's, where, that's what keeps me up at night. So we did look at a very brief, and I think brief was probably better, definition of, CAS, of CASRI definition of, of data curation. Um, and what I liked about this definition is it says it's saving data, or creating data to the point where it can be fit for contemporary purpose and available for discovery and reuse. 
And if that doesn't distill what we're all here about, then I don't know what does. Nature had an article a while back, which I think if you haven't seen, you should probably look at it, made the rounds on the CanLib data list and other lists, 11 ways to avert a data storage disaster. And they list 11 reasons or 11 ways to avert such a disaster. The second one spoke to me because it's what we are. We're the specialists. And so talk to your specialists. And so your institution employs people who think about this on a full-time basis. Now, for some of us, I think, you're, yeah, right, full-time. I dream of full-time thinking about this. But for those of you who do have some time to think about this, you are valuable to your institution. And Harvard University um, librarian at, uh, in charge of data curation says, your research computing center might offer free or low-cost storage or backup. Your librarian can help you to craft a data management plan. Your grants office can help you on funding agency requirements. And all of this would be for the purpose of you being able to save your data and meet all of the requirements associated with uh, data management these days. They want to help you keep your data, especially if you have a grant. Sure, especially if you have a grant, but because it's the right thing to do as well. All of this, I would say, and other things we'll be talking about over the course of the next day and a half, are data curation. In a dear colleague letter to the National Science Foundation, they talked about putting data in a form that others can use it may require work that goes above and beyond the stated research activity. This can be called data curation or data cleaning or data wrangling. And we had on our first day a session on Open Refine and R to wrangle your data that was offered downstairs and I was desperately anxious. The geek in me wanted to be downstairs with John Simpson taking the course in R and Open Refine, but I was up here in another very interesting session on, on data curation and, and I don't remember what the title of it was, but I don't remember offhand. But it, it really is important for us to know how to curate or clean or prepare our data for storage. The key point of this is, is that the budget work for this, and this is true in Canada now as well, if you have uh, interest in doing data management, and you should, you can include it in your grant application. So in as early as 2013, the National Science Foundation allowed principal investigators to report data products in their biographical sketches, and this extension put scientific data sets on the same level as scientific articles or academic articles in the schema of of you know our peer review and promotion uh, scenario that we're in Canada. So we need to think about a culture change that takes the value of data and gives it that credibility and that value so that we have in fact the support on our campuses to see data curated through to, to repositories and beyond. So against this backdrop, we have our funding agencies, and we have representatives of our funding agencies here today, and we're very grateful to have them here. We have SHRC and CIHR, I think. Okay, you're allowed to raise your hands, I think, right? <laughs> okay, thank you. They're allowed to raise their hands. They can't say much more unless you corner them and ask them quietly, because we're in the middle of an election period and they can't they can't stay, say stuff on policy. So, um, SHRC put out capitalizing on big data in 2013. <coughs> followed up, up with a statement of principles in 2016. And in 20, actually that should be 2016. 2016, May of 2016, uh, we had a representative from SHRC come to Queen's University in May and give a presentation that showed these same three pillars. Four years on, we're waiting. And our colleagues from the tri-agencies will just nod and in sympathy with us on that front. So we are anticipating that the policy will drop sometime early in the new year and that there will be a phased and incremental um, implementation of that policy. And I expect that you would see the first requirement for institutional research data management strategies coming into force early in 2021. So we are looking at well over a year now for you to get that, that first policy in place. And then the second policy might be set six months later, so data management plans might be required and staged in over the next six months and beyond. And then finally deposit sometime early in 2022. So we've got a fairly long window here. And I was saying to one of, my, one of our tri-agency colleagues, 
earlier that, gee, you know, we've been waiting since 2016. And in a way, I think it's a blessing that they have waited this long because we've gotten ourselves in a lot better shape, I think, today than we were four years ago to address this policy when it comes down. And this is this 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 convocation of you guys here is witness to that. I think we're getting a lot bit, a lot closer to being able to deal with this in a, in a very substantive way. 2014, the government of Canada put out seizing Canada's moment. And in 2015, developing a digital research infrastructure strategy. And I'm not sure if that was the first instance of DRI being mentioned in this fashion. Probably not, but it's one of the first ones that I could find. We had in 2017 an ISET funded process through the Leadership Council for Digital Research Infrastructure, um, published two major reports, one on data management and one on advanced research computing. Follow up to these two reports was a coordination report that presented visions for the future of DRI in Canada, which were then put out and workshopped and consulted on in the community. And what I'm presenting here today is the culmination of that consultation report and these two previous reports from LCDRI to ISED. Against all of this, we've got Portage. Portage has been working in this space since 2015. Um, and we've got as well, and I think is Mark Leggett here? He's on a call, he's on a research data, he's on a steering committee call, I knew that. Mark Leggett from Research Data Canada is here and the two, these two national organizations have been working together over the last numbers of years to ensure that we've got uh, progress made on supporting research data management here in Canada. Portage does has, a, I'm not going to go over this in any detail because you've seen these slides before and if you haven't, they're on our website and you haven't been paying attention. We have a network of exper experts uh, and we have an in, a, a large range of infrastructure platforms, services and tools that are available to Canadian institutions and researchers. We have expert groups and working groups numbering 130 plus in-kind volunteers from campuses across Canada and organizations across Canada. Um, the latest of which is this data repositories expert group, which after naming it and not thinking too carefully has an unfortunate acronym, DREG. So there it is. So we have, uh, we're fortunate we have the CIO of the University of Toronto serving as the chair of that committee, um, Bo Wanschneider, who is a longtime data li library folk person from, from years back. So we've got really good people in good places in and among all of these groups. And just for the sake of the people who aren't members, how many people in here are working with or for Portage in some fashion or other? That's pretty remarkable. I mean, I think that alone speaks to the importance of this large network of experts and the community of practice that it represents. We are working locally, witness all of you folks who are embedded locally. We're working regionally with our regional library consortia, and we're working nationally with our partners at the national level, including the tri-agencies and our, our um, funding agency, the, the funders at ISED. So we've been busy. And this last little bit is really exciting, DRI funding, transition funding, it's really just very exciting stuff now. I added them, and I'm, thinking I might have to retire this because it's getting really, really big and long and I'd have to shrink everything and you'd never read it anyway. So we might have to retire this particular graphic. But this is what speaks to me. 15 people, 42 people, 98 people, 115, and now 130 working with and for Portage. That's the strength of what we're doing. So digital research infrastructure and research data management. This is the current DRI landscape. And it's not the worst org chart I've ever seen, but it's certainly not the best. And I did see one that was worse that I can talk to about later, and certainly we can discuss it. But this is a bit, a bit messy. And I think where it's messiest is probably the research software, which doesn't really have a home anyway. There's no one person speaking for research software. But certainly data management has a couple of groups working with it and for it. CFI is in there with its 60-40 funding model. It's a really complicated um, scenario. So this part of it is what's 
a bit nasty right now. In February of 2018, the government promised $572.5 million to address the digital research infrastructure question. And what they came up with is this. This is after consultations on the consultation document from LCDRI. This is after a lot of toing and froing with the community. This is the model that they proposed. With $375 million going to create the new organization and $137 million going to Canary, data management getting $2 million of one-year funding, advanced research computing getting $50 million, and Canary CFI and Compute Canada continuing to support research software for the moment. Looking ahead, okay, so this is where we are right now. The 50 million is for ARC, for Advanced Research Computing, is to immediately increase the national advanced research computing platform's capacity at the existing five national host sites. For Canary, it's to continue their mandate as a network, national network for education and research, but with a renewed mandate including enhanced cybersecurity and dedicated funding for northern connectivity. So that's what these pockets of money are going toward. The 375 million is going toward the new DRI organization. And that new DRI organization has been, the process has started and we have four people in our uh, applicant board running the process to move us toward this new organization. How many of you were able to attend the consultations that went across the country? So not so many, they were very fast to get, they, they didn't give much lead time and it was boom, 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 there they are. And, and so it maybe wasn't attended as well. Uh, you know, I, I maybe have some concerns about that, but one of the things I will say is it was focused exclusively on governance and membership. What was the membership model for this new organization? It was not focused on any of the nuts and bolts of how DRI is done, how ARC is being run, how research software will be run. So these are very experienced people. They know what they're doing, and I have confidence that they'll come up with a model that will work well. So this new organization will have three components. Those three components will work, I think, very synergistically together. We are already, as you may have heard, working closely with our advanced research computing partners on the FURTER project. And there are a lot of other synergies, I think, that can be realized through our relationship with, within that new organization rather than being separate from them. And we're also expected by the government to work closely with network. And if they're doing anything with cybersecurity, it's pretty obvious that we're gonna have to be working closely with them as well on that front. So we do have converging streams of activity. On the one hand, we have 375 million, which by the way is not in the hands of the applicant board. They're working toward getting that money for the next round. They're really, it's all a staged approach. They don't have that money sitting in a bank account. They're working toward getting that money, but that money has been earmarked, it's good to go. So while we're working toward this new organization, we can't just leave data management sitting in the wings. We needed to keep something going. Portage was doing stuff on the, on the backs of the Carl directors. They were funding us for the last four years, and it seemed unreasonable to expect them to continue funding us during this transition period. So we did receive $2 million of one-year transition funding from ICED. That money is flowing through Canary, because Canary is an organization that had the infrastructure to actually make that happen. And all of this happened before the election call. And that was very important. And we were getting a little bit anxious, shall we say, when you start seeing, and you never know what a government's going to do. They could say, yeah, we're going to call it early because strategically it's on our best interest. Well, that would have messed us up. But they didn't. They waited kindly until into September, and we made it. And so progress toward the new organization. Where are we now? Well, we had initial, initial signatories back in May of, uh, May of this year, government approval, the applicant board was established, and I've shown you them already. The next step will be for them to establish an inaugural board. They will not necessarily be the same people. In fact, they probably will not be the same people who are in the applicant board. 
and then ultimately we'll have a new DR organization sometime in 2021. I've heard people say it could happen sooner, but I'm not so sure. You know, these days it's hard to see how fast government works. When I think of, well, I don't know, a certain RDM policy, I just can't help but think that it might take a bit longer to get this organization up and running. But in any case, they're aiming for 2021. <coughs> On the RDM front, we have $2 million of funding from ICED. And the first thing that we're doing, it's a two-pronged approach. The first is to expand national support through the Secretariat, which has been small, 2.5 people. We're going to expand that to eight people. And we're adding a training coordinator, a curation coordinator, a discovery and metadata coordinator, a preservation coordinator at halftime, a project manager, a halftime communications officer, and translation, website travel, training, and outreach. We do, I'm happy to say, have our incoming curation coordinator here with us today. If you want to stand up, Erin. Erin Clary comes to us all the way from North Carolina. And she, she I, I don't have her full bio here, and so I'm not going to try. I'll just, she works currently, or has been working with Dryad, which is a ecology. So it's been around for some time, and she's also got connections with DCN, the Digital Digital Curation Network. Data curation, data curation. Thank you so much. More water. <laughs> okay, and we also have. Is Veronica here? Veronica is in the back there. Veronica is our, our project officer, um, project manager, I should say. She uh, comes to us with a strong background from the Carl office, where she was the financial officer working with the Carl office. So we we're very grateful to have her join us. And so we're starting strong, and we've completed interviews for the other positions, and we are just waiting for some formalities to take place uh, and such. So all of this will be helping us in. Helping us help researchers achieve the FAIR principles throughout the research life cycle in partnership with our network of experts and our growing community of practice. And all of this as well includes work with institutional partners who have been key to our progress as well. So the first, and this worked out to be roughly half and half, the first half of the two million went to the National Portage Secretariat support. The other half has gone to institutional partners that we've been working with. And so the first partner, this isn't any particular order, but the first partner was uh, Oakle Scholars Portal um, out of the University of Toronto, working with us in context, context of Dataverse North, offering a, a national instance of Dataverse for Canadian researchers. The, the national instance of Dataverse is also working on improved geospatial visualization and discovery for data. The FURTER project, the Federated Research Data Repository, is a partnership between Compute Canada and Portage, but we're also working with the University of Saskatchewan and with Simon Fraser University and the University of Waterloo as hosting sites. We've developed use case scenarios for Dataverse and FURTER so that people can make an informed choice as to which of these repositories at the national sort of multidisciplinary level they should be choosing. We've got improved metadata for further discovery that if you were here in the first day and a half, Lee made very, very brief mention of mapping um, terms to the FAST uh, subject schema from the Library of Congress and expanded metadata, metadata harvesting to expand discovery. So I understand from the presentation I heard earlier this morning that there are now 45 uh, repositories from across Canada harvested into further and discoverable in a national discovery layer. So that's really exposing data from other repositories and driving traffic back to those repositories so that people can find those, those data sets. And the third is the DMP Assistant, which has been hosted since its inception in Canada by the University of Alberta. And we're looking to migrate DMP to the DMP Assistant to the new version, the DMP Roadmap and it promises to improve researcher experience and functionality of the interface. The DMP Exemplars group is looking at finding good DMPs 
and we're actually building a, a repository for DMPs, purpose-built for discovery. And it's also going to, it promises to provide, what does API stand for again? Application, application Program Interface? Yes! <laughs> to facilitate sharing among the systems that will help reduce administrative burden. CASRAE is involved as well in a, in a contractor kind of way to provide a glossary of research management information terms and to work on developing that in embedding that within a DMP with those within a DMP so that we have better RMI information within the context of our DMPs. We also are working closely with Canary and RDC. Uh, Canary is a flower of funds from ICED to Carl Portage and RDC through various initiatives including a national uh, training initiative um, that they're working on with uh, a number of partners including Portage as well as our partners with the tri-agencies. So Portage is working closely with RDC as well in other ways and I've got that arrow pointing over to research software because if there's one area where RDC has uh, contributed it's in um, the notion of research software but they've also developed a national data service framework meetings an opportunity to network and discuss much the same way as we're talking about curation. They're looking at how we would serve up uh, national data services in Canada. A lot of the work that Portage is doing sort of speaks to what they've been talking about. There's another one coming up in, uh, in the spring of 2021. Um, I keep your eyes open for that. I would certainly encourage you to come to that uh, summit if you have the possibility. They do webinars as well and collaborating as I mentioned on training initiatives. As well, circling back to the, the funding calls, there's a funding call out from 2018 that was, was quite popular and, and got a lot of uptake, including a, a geospatial, the geospatial uh, in, enterprise that I was talking about earlier. But there's also another funding competition, which just because of timing, has a deadline at the end of this month. So you can imagine we're going, oh, how can we manage that. But there are a number of initiatives that are, are taking advantage of, the, of this that we're aware of. And so we're very grateful for the community's resilience in, this, in, in the September timeframe, September-October timeframe, to be actually tackling a grant application like this. So let's circle back briefly to RDM and curation. Um, for those of you who were here this morning, the Mentimeter tool that you're all going to be using for questions also has a very neat type in a word and I'll make a word cloud feature. And this is what came up. And right in the middle of that is community. And I'm convinced that the community is the strongest piece of this whole curation enterprise. And right there below DOIs, I guess DOIs are pretty important too, but on the people <laughs> side, community came up as very important. So if you look back, we've got a lot of people working in this space. And everything that these folks are doing in all of these expert and working groups ties back to the curation model that we were talking about earlier, the curation steps, the components of curation. And looking at our sort of environment here with the new organization and the work that Portage is doing, we are really lucky to be, I think, to be part of this new organization and not separate from. We are, in fact, the new kid on the block. Research software has been around for a long time. ARC, Compute Canada, has been around for a long time. Data management wasn't even on the radar 10 years ago. It's been on the radar more in recent years, and certainly the tri-agency policy has helped a lot. But that's amazing that we're there. So curation will benefit from that. I think having a curation coordinator and having all of these other coordinators will be an amazing help as well to us in this space. And this meeting here today and the outputs from it and your thoughts on how we should proceed are going to really be beneficial to us as we go forward. So we're looking forward to hearing more from you over the course of the next couple of days. We also have national platform support. Um, we are looking at curation for further and curation for, for Dataverse as well. There's work happening, the sessions this morning, for those of you who were here in this room, heard more about that. And there's a lot going on and lots more work to do. So with that, um, and with these acknowledgements, um, I don't know what time it is because I don't have a clock in front of me. And if minutes. I look at my watch, I'll spill my water on 10 minutes for questions. 10 minutes for questions.
and you can put questions up there if people have already started typing them in. They should be up there. Well, I can see them here. So you should see them there. So you have to actually click answer to see the questions that have been submitted if you want to upload uh, one of the questions or add your own, please. Yeah. Is that the question? So we're gonna we're gonna give everyone one second okay. to, to do their voting or to add more questions. All right. Or people have questions. Or I can just say questions in the old fashioned way. Yeah. It works <laughs> this way. And it's crazy. Talk. <laughs> That's crazy talk, Jason. No, no. Yes. Why is um, Cortana not on the news or chart? I mean, Cortana wasn't. The first in the comparison of the two org charts that you showed. Right, it, it was there. It's there yeah. coming in. Yeah. But it's not on the new one. It was there under the old charts. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
they, they needed to be told. I think it's fair to say they needed to be reminded, they needed to be informed, and they were like just, I'll say somewhat gobsmacked at how much we'd achieved with so little over such a short period of time. So, can you read it out, Jeff? Has there been any thinking to extend data management services to non-academic organizations in Canada? For instance, public libraries. Are there any barriers? Um, well, if the, there are two ways of answering that. One is that the resources that we're building out, we're trying as far as possible to make them open. They are not intended to be in any way closed down. So anybody can sign up. My mother could sign up for a, a DMP assistant account if she wanted to. I don't think she'd know quite what to do with it, but she could if she wanted to. I think that um, the other driver that's sort of pushing all of this is this the funding agencies, RDM requirements, the policy. So I'm not sure, unless public libraries are doing funded research, there would be no onus on them to do this. Uh, but if they want to just be good data stewards of any data they may collect, then I don't see why they shouldn't be able to avail themselves of the tools, platform services that we're, we're, we're rolling out. Another question. Will Portage continue to exist in New York? <laughs> to be determined. Um, how, how the new org decides to brand the data management pillar within the new organization uh, remains to be seen. They haven't even come up with the actual uh, the name of the new organization. The one person, who, I'll leave her nameless for the moment, said it should be called Canada Dry. <laughs> but it's not too sweet. I don't know. Um, and for for you, Aaron, Canada Dry is ginger ale. Dry. Sorry. Anyway, that was that was uh, yeah. So I don't know whether Portage Portage as an entity may continue. There may there may be seen to be some value in that brand because it's known and we have stickers. But other than that, I don't know. We do have to think about the broader um, RDM community and the activities that are happening in this space, and not all of it is is currently happening under under the auspices of Carl Portage. And on that note, Mark just arrives. <laughs> so there's RDC as well. Mark Leggett is the executive director of Research Data Canada. I was thinking about. I made kind of reference to you. <laughs> Jeff, we have time for one more question. We have time for one more question. It's a long one. <laughs> All right. Thinking about the whole continuum of activities, what, from your perspective, is the most significant RDM infrastructure gap, policy, technology, HQP, that is yet to be addressed? Well, if you, if you said to me, answer this question, snap, you've got to answer it quickly, the first thing that comes to my mind, and I, it may not be in your mind, is sensitive data. Um, to me, we are, we are facing a, a tsunami of data, and if, it, if it's relatively easy data, even if it's slightly challenging data, but it's not sensitive data, we can handle that. Just bring it on, we'll, just, we'll curate the hell out of it. We'll get that going. But we don't have infrastructure in place right now to handle, I don't think, uh, handle sensitive data in a systematic, national, organized way. Not that that's the way it should be handled, but you know, it's all sort of more localized, and if you've got infrastructure and somebody who can build a secure server and whatever, that's fine. But we, I think we really do need to address the issue of sensitive data. And that, you know, if you open up sensitive data and unpack that, it can be another conversation for another entire conference. So, yeah. And with that, I think I've taken my allotted time and we can move on. Thank you. Okay. Thanks again to Jeff. Uh, that was a fantastic kind of setup for everything that we're gonna we're gonna cover uh, in what's to come. I think we're gonna take five minutes. Let people stretch their legs. I think there's some coffee that we need to drink before the next coffee comes in. So feel free to grab some coffee or muffins or, or whatever you want back there. We will reconvene at uh, 2:05, and we'll get ready for the panel discussion. Thanks.